So yesterday at about 7 o'clock in the morning, I went straight to my notes and I went to my Bible and I started do, um, prepping a brand new message. And this message is fresh off the press. Um, it's, uh, it's already been delivered at the 715 service, but I really felt that this is what I needed to end the Are We There Yet? end time series on this message here today. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your grace. And I know everybody's that come to the house of the Lord. It is such an honor and a blessing to have you guys here today. Um, as we've come to the end of this series, we have to go back and remember the words of the apostle John, who was the youngest of all of the disciples of Jesus, who was a follower of Jesus. And um, he's an old man. He's in his 80s and he's on the island of Patmos where they thought he was going to die. But some scholars believe he didn't die. He actually went went back to the seven churches in Revelation that were around Asia Minor in modern day Turkey and he delivered every single one of the messages that Jesus had for each church. So we've already gone through the seven churches of the book of Revelation. You can get that on our YouTube channel and please go there and check that out. We also talked about Daniel and the prophecy of Daniel and the 70 weeks and how we are in the 69th week and the 70th week will be the seven years of the tribulation period. Uh, we studied that. We studied about the bowls. We studied about the vibe. The, the, the judgments and all of those things that are going to happen on this earth. But the reason why we are actually sharing this message and the reason why God has end times prophecy for us is because, not because he can't wait to blow this place up. That's far from it. It's because he loves us. It's because he loves us and he sent his son Jesus. The Bible says in John chapter 3, 16 that God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And there's a reason why he sent his son Jesus and it is to save us. And that's why you and I, I know I might be preaching to the choir. That's why we're thankful for the end times prophecy. And we're thankful that even if we get to live through this time, that he is our shelter, he is our shield, that he is our reward in the name of Jesus. Somebody say amen. amen. So when we look at this, and I want you to open your Bibles to 2 Timothy and then go to 2 Peter. And I'm going to contrast and highlight Two incredible men of God that actually wrote so much on the last days. Um, in, second, uh, in, in Second Timothy, in Second Thessalonians, there are so many parts that the apostles wrote on. We're living in incredible times right now before our very eyes. We're seeing some of the most amazing yet catastrophic things that are going on in our world today, especially in our country. America is not the only country to go through a pandemic or go through economic collapse, um, whether where this origin came from, how this all started. That's not for this forum. That's not for this opportunity. But I want you to know that right now, it's not that God was surprised in heaven Go, oh my goodness, oh myself, what is going on? You know what I'm talking about? He saw this coming like he sees everything coming that is headed for our lives and he is aware and he cares with the elections the divisions in the nation the pandemic the shutting down of cities some churches prevented from meeting in different parts of the country or different parts of the world people dying depression and anxiety skyrocketing marriage stress teenagers having a hard time little kids on ipads all the time social media and apps i can tell you right now that we are living in amazingly complicated times the reason why I decided to switch and pivot this message and not talk to you about the new Jerusalem, not talk to you about a new heaven and a new earth. You can go online and watch that. The reason why I wanted to get this one last shot is to let us know what are the signs of the times. What are the signs of the times? So when we look at the signs of the times, I can tell you right now that it wasn't different in the days of Noah, and it wasn't different in the days of Lot. We are living out those days right now. I want you to go to 2 Timothy with me, please. And I want you to go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 to 5. And Paul is writing to his young protege, Timothy. Timothy could very well at this moment be preaching and leading the church in Ephesus. Remember, it was the first church in the book of Revelation. It was the biggest church, the most prominent church. They did everything right, but they lost their love. They became more legalistic than they should have. Um, they upheld the truth, but to a fault, so to speak, and they had lost their love for the community, and most importantly, they lost their love for God. But Timothy, now at this moment, uh, is being exhorted by his mentor, Paul. And um, he says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, he says, but mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. Terrible times in the last days. And this is what it's going to look like. And he gives 19 traits what the times of the last days will look like. He says this, people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, uh, ungrateful, unholy, without love, 
unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, and brutal, not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with these people. Essentially, Paul is writing to Timothy. He says, Timothy, you really want to know what the last days are going to look like. You really want to know what are the signs of the times. You don't need a blood moon for me to tell you. You don't need to see anything else right now in the sea or in the sky or what is happening on earth. I can tell you it's happening with people. And these are 19 things that are happening with people right now. And these are the signs of the times. Now, I want you to know I'm not excited about this day to come. I want you to know. I, it's not that, oh, I can't wait. Ooh, I can't. I, I can't. I, I'm looking forward to the trumpet sound, the archangel shout, and the dead rising in Christ. Oh, absolutely, I'm looking forward to that day. But I'm not looking forward to what's going to happen to this earth. I thank God we're not going to be here. I thank God that, um, that we're going to escape this fiery trial of the seven years of tribulation. But I'm not looking forward to this day. I just got to be honest. I, 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 I'm okay if Jesus tarries. Okay? Okay? I'm okay if Jesus waits a little bit longer. I love my daughters. I love my grandkids. I want to see them grow up. I want to see Bowie and Otis grow up. I want to be in their lives more often. So I'm okay if it tarries. I, in fact, I need, to get, uh, I need to get Otis saved. You know what I'm talking about? He's only four years old. That boy needs salvation. You know what I'm talking about? He needs to get saved. But I can tell you this, that in the last days, these are what it's going to look like. But when we go with me, please, to 2 Peter, and when you go to 2 Peter chapter 2 and you're turning there in your Bibles, let me give you a little bit of background of Peter. Uh, John was the youngest disciple, and Peter, James, and John were all related. But you also have to understand that Peter was the most brash, outspoken of all of the disciples that Jesus had. If you remember, Jesus, uh, Peter had open mouth, insert foot syndrome. He had foot and mouth disease. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, he, he, he was always getting himself into trouble. He was bodacious. He was voracious. He was uh, outspoken. He was loud. Uh, he was the center of attention. He used his hands a lot when he spoke. Um, he, he, needed, he needed that. But before I read this, I want you to know that Peter, at the end of the day, even though he failed Jesus three times and denied him and wasn't even at the cross, but John was, Peter came back stronger than ever and lived up to the reputation that Jesus had on his life and told him, Peter, your name means little rock, but upon this rock, upon this truth that you have spoken, the gates of hell will not prevail. Uh, they, they will try to prevail, but they will not, and I will build my church in the name of Jesus, although hell will try to take you down and take the church down, it will not happen in the name of Jesus. Somebody say amen. amen. So Peter, when he writes and he, come, he, he, says, he, he, he says, don't call it a comeback. You know what I'm talking about? Because I was already there. When Peter begins to write these words, you have to understand the weight of these words after his failure, after the prophecy over his life. And he writes, and this is what it's going to look like. He says this, for God did not spare even the angels who sinned, he threw them into, the, into hell, the gloomy pits of darkness, where they are being held until the day of judgment. That verse 4, right there, is a whole sermon. If you remember on a couple of weeks ago, I don't even know if it's a four weeks ago, whatever it was, I talked about how Ezekiel spoke about the fall of Lucifer. His name is now Satan, who was one of the archangels in heaven, and he took one-third of the angels with him. They, these are called fallen angels. They're also known as demons to this day, and these are the ones that are on earth that are tormenting people, tempting people, bringing up incredible trials and situations. You have to remember that Satan is the god of this air. The, the earth is, has been, uh, he's been allowed to have reign over the earth for a period of time. Jesus is coming back to set things right. Now remember, he came from heaven. His name was Lucifer. And that's why it says, verse 4, that all of the angels sinned. They sinned in heaven and they followed Lucifer. And now they are demons here on earth. And if you didn't know that, newsflash, that's really important for us to know. Now two-thirds of the angels that are in heaven are led by God, of course. And then you have archangels who are there that's, that there's a hierarchy that they take charge over here. But he said, in the last days, this is what's going to happen. They're going to be released eventually, um, but they're here to torment. Then in verse 5, he says, And God did not spare the ancient world or the Old Testament days except for Noah and the seven others in his family. So Noah and his family, out of the, we don't know how many thousands of people inhabited the earth during that time, but during that time, all the people that inhabited the earth, God couldn't find one 
righteous person on earth. Wickedness was abound, and God said, I'm going to start all over again, okay? So God is peaceful, God is loving, God is gentle, but also there's a side that you don't want to get God mad. You know what I'm talking about? And so he starts all over, and this family of eight, he builds an ark, and they're building, and rain had not even fallen on the earth yet. And why are you building a boat? There is no rain. And finally, when the heavens open up and the wells of the earth opened as well, then the flood came and the people were sad and definitely devastated and horrif- horrified that they did not get themselves into the ark with Noah when Noah had given them an opportunity. Think about that for a moment. He said, except for Noah and the seven others in his family. So that's eight people. Noah warned the world of God's righteous judgment. So God protected Noah. Everybody say protected. So God protected Noah when he destroyed the world of ungodly people with a vast flood. Then in verse 6, later, God condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and turned them into heaps of ashes. And he made them an example of what will happen to ungodly people. And But God also rescued Lot out of Sodom because he was a righteous man who was sick of the shameful immorality of the wicked people around him. So another opportunity of wickedness all around. Yes, Lot was a righteous man who was tormented in his soul by the wicked he saw and heard day after day so you see the Lord knows how to rescue godly people from their trials and that's important for us to know even while keeping the wicked under punishment until the day of judgment he is especially hard on those who follow their own twisted sexual desire who despise authority that's the key here it is not just the wickedness it is not just that it is the immorality and the despising of authority. So, you know, the apostle Peter, he uses a Greek word, and the Greek word literally translated just means filthy. It's, it's filthy. Think about this for a moment. When you think about all of the destruction that's coming, now here it comes, and I just got to tell you, um, we don't know when he's coming. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 36, Jesus said, even Jesus himself said, however, no one knows the day or the hour when these things will happen. Not even the angels in heaven or the son himself, only the father knows. So we don't know when it's happening, but we know it's happening. Not even Jesus knows, but the father knows. What we do know from Bible prophecy, what we do know from Bible prophecy is that we are in the almost to the final week of the weeks of, of basically a week is seven days. A seven days is a seven years according to biblical prophecy in this instance. And I want you to know that you can trust biblical prophecy. In other words, 20% of the entire Bible is prophetic in nature. That means future telling. Now, this ain't Nostradamus. You know what I'm talking about? God does not bat 400. For those of you wondering what I mean by that, like baseball. If you are batter and you bat 400, you're really, really good. God doesn't bat 400. God bats 1,000. Every single thing that he has said has come to pass. There are over 300 prophetic prophecies on the first coming of Jesus, his birth. 300 based upon his first. Every single one fulfilled to the letter. There are eight, an 8 to 1 ratio of, all, uh, of second coming prophecies over the first coming prophecies of Jesus Christ. And the leading eschatologist, that's not a dermatologist, it's an eschatologist, <laughs> that's someone that teaches on the end times. The leading eschatologist says that 1,845 references in the Old Testament and New Testament combined talk about his second coming. So if Jesus was already fulfilled in all 300 at an 8 to 1 ratio, 1 to 8 ratio, then you can bet, be sure, that everything that God says about Jesus coming back and the rapture and what the end times look like, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. So you cannot waver between two opinions. You cannot straddle the fence in your faith. You've got to be all in because if you're half in, I don't know if we make it. And I love you enough to tell you, and I may not have met everybody yet, and I just can't wait to meet you without your mask. You know what I'm talking about? That one day, this is what I'm believing. I'm believing that this is all right, that this is the biblical prophecy is true, that we're not going through this earth just for some random reason, that you were not born without a cause or without a purpose, without a date that God had already set apart for you, that you were formed together in your mother's womb, that God already knew you, Pick the day that you would live, the situation that you would be here in church, because he loves you. He loves you. And that's why God is not willing that anyone would perish. 
that all would come to repentance. But I can tell you right now, the days are not looking good. When you look at those 19 things that Paul wrote to Timothy and told him in the last days, this is what it's all going to look like. This is what it's all going to look like. We put them into four different categories. I want to t- thank Pastor Jimmy Evans, Mililani, Pastor Jimmy Evans, Honolulu, who has given me in this book, and I want you to pick up this book when you get a chance. It's called The Tipping Point. The Tipping Point by Pastor Jimmy Evans. What an incredible book about living in the last days. It will encourage you. It's not going to scare you. It's, it's meant to prepare you. In the name of Jesus, somebody say amen. amen. So what we believe is according to 1 Thessalonians, Chapter 5, verse 9 says, For God has not destined us for wrath. Just like he took out Noah and his family, Lot and his family. When you take Noah, Noah had eight members of his family. Him and his wife, his three sons, and, two, and three daughters-in-law. Okay? Apparently, rumor says that he wanted to chuck one of the daughters-in-law over, but he didn't. No, just kidding. Never mind. never happened. That was just a joke. It was just a joke. Just trying to make you laugh. Come on, everybody. I can't read you. I can't read you now with masks on. I can't feel the love anymore. Anyway, um, so there's eight. Lot, his wife, and two daughters, that's four. That number's 12. And while I spent another three hours on my sermon last night, going, this has got to get better, this has got to get better, this has got to get better. And I can tell you this, eight plus four equals 12. Very good. Do you know what biblical numerology the number 12 stands for? Governance, authority, faith, and the church. We are not appointed to wrath. The eight were taken out. The four were taken out. Of course, Lot's wife turned around and looked, and she shouldn't have looked, and she turned into a pillar of salt because she never listened to her husband. Anyway, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Just trying to help my brothers out here today. No elbows, no elbows, no elbows on the wife, no elbows on the wife. But I'm saying that one that did not listen is like a Judas. Jesus had 12 disciples. There were 12 tribes of Israel because there were 12 sons that Jacob had. The number 12 is governance. There are going to be 24 elders in heaven worshiping around the throne of God. 12 disciples, 12 tribes of Israel, 24. The number 12 is absolutely significant. And when we look at the number 12, what God is going to do, that he's taking up the church. He took up the eight. He took up the four. That's 12. He took them up. They were not appointed to wrath. He rescued them. I believe we're going to rescue. He's going to rescue the church in the name of Jesus. Somebody say amen. amen. Because we got to believe it because the, t- the things that are going to happen are, are cataclysmic in nature because of the sexual immorality of the day and the despising of the authority. So I want to give you the four categories that Pastor Jimmy Evans gives us. And the first one is this. Out of that 19, number one, this is the first category. It's the exaltation of self. It's the exaltation of self. It is the exaltation of self. More than just a selfie, it is a self behind the selfie. Now, if I ever put a selfie on Instagram, please forgive me. That's not what I'm trying to do. But I can tell you this. It's the exaltation of the self. Uh, When you look at the, it is actually called narcissism today, in today's terms. He says people will be lovers of self, boastful, proud, haughty, headstrong. And and most of us who are older, and I'm not going to tell you how I'm old. You're going to have to guess. I know, you you guess too high. But anyway, but I can tell you this. I grew up in a day and age where where there was more respect. There was more authority that was honored. There was was elders that you never talked back to. You, even if someone else scolded you and they were not your, your parent, you still, you still honored that because they were older than you. I grew up in a, in a day and age where the athletes like Dr. Julius Irving handled themselves with class and respect, even though we, do know, we don't know what's going on, be, uh, uh, on behind the closed door scenes, but we just, uh, all I knew was the man was amazing by the way he played, by the way he responded, and by the way that he dressed and carried himself. Tom Landry, The former coach of the Dallas Cowboys, that used to be my favorite team. Used to be my favorite team. I don't have a team anymore, but I remember Tom Landry. He was respectful. He was a solid Christian. Wore a nice fedora hat. The owner was Tex Schramm. And they ran a very good, respectable organization. But when I saw the other organization come in, I saw the culture shift. Not just in athletics, but even in television. I grew up in the age of the 80s, where I feel like the last age of innocence was truly gone in the 80s. When movies 
movies started coming out that were good and wholesome. And all of a sudden, they took a hard turn with movies like Fast Times at Ridgemont High. You know what I'm talking about? Stop giggling under your mask. You know what I'm talking about? And I remember those movies. I said, I can't believe I'm watching this, and I can't believe my parents don't know. You know what I'm talking about? And I remember that even I grew up in a day and age that if you just sighed in front of your parents, it was considered back talk. <laughs> Who's with me? I just went, oh, oh. Don't, what, what did you just say? What did you say? You t- 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 I remember that there was a time where I was, I, I tried to push the boundaries of disrespect, not on purpose, but to see what I could get away with, try to impress my friends. And I said something to a young girl that wasn't nice. My father found out, about, found out about it from her father. Her father called my father. As soon as I got home, my father yelled at me, told me to get in the car, and we drove to their house. He made me knock on the door and stand there and apologize to the girl for what I said to her with her mother standing there with her hands on her hips looking at me and I remember crying crying everybody and I was a senior in high school (laughs) the exaltation of self number three the rejection of authority the rejection of authority when we reject authority the apostle Paul says many will reject authority in the last days they will be disobedient to their parents, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, reject the authority. When you look at what's going on in the world, I can tell you a very small percentage of there are always one bad apple that spoils the whole bunch. It's always bound to happen. It happens in the ministry. It happens in the military. It happens in law enforcement. You can name it, but you can, when you think about what's going on, law enforcement personnel in the United States and throughout the world are under assault. No longer is the military honored like it used to be. We got to bring that back. If I was ever disrespectful to a teacher, I can tell you, my dad would pull this ear and my mom would pull this one and I'd look like the God Mad Magazine. When you think about all of this lawlessness that is going on, the rejection of authority, God's, God's delegated authority here on earth is so important for us to understand. But remember, the Antichrist was called the lawless one. He was called the lawless one. In other words, no holds barred, there's no rules, and the Antichrist spirit, I'm going to talk about that later on, um, later on. Here's number three. The third thing that we get in this category of immorality, number three, is the rejection of moral standards. The rejection of moral standards. Today, if anyone announces or says or makes a pledge that I'm going to be a virgin until marriage, they are mocked. They're targeted for their beliefs and even sent to be tempted by another person in order to take away that virginity as a badge of honor. Shame. It's my body. I can do whatever I want to do with it. That's the society that we live in today. It hasn't gotten us anywhere good. We are in danger as a society, not just of our biblical moral standards. But in contrast, when people use their body for good rather than sin, they're ridiculed for doing so. Paul warned us that there would be despisers of good, and he was definitely right. Remember the prophet Jeremiah says, woe to those who do good, who call good evil and evil good. Woe to you who call evil good and good evil. It's a death day like that right now. If you've been watching and you're seeing, it is definitely a sign of the time. Number four, number four, they will be vicious and unloving. Paul says people in the last days, they're going to be disloyal. They're going to be unloving. They'll be verbally vicious. It may not be physically in front of you, but it's going to happen online. It's happening on social media. you got to be careful. Don't let that trap trip you up in Jesus' name. Be very, very careful. You can tell I got my my groove back. I'm feeling really confident about this message because I can tell you right now that there's nothing that makes me more passionate about what is going on. And I'm not the guy to stand on the corner. I'm not the guy to show up at a protest, but I'm the guy to show up with protesting in prayer. I can tell you right now, I've been protesting in prayer what God is doing, but you know, when you think about everything, what the media is doing, what the media is doing, I can tell you it's unbelievable. Back in a time when President Franklin Roosevelt, our president during World War II, how many of you knew that he had polio? Raise your hand. Okay, a lot of people knew he had polio. Most Americans, while he was president, had no idea that the president had polio. You know why? Because the photographers and the media 
would not show him in a compromised position. They wanted them to see a strong commander-in-chief. That's what they wanted them to see. It wasn't until after he died that it leaked that he actually had polio. On the last days of his life that he had polio. People were shocked. They had no idea that the president had polio. They would lift him up when he came to the lectern and when he began at the podium, when he began to, began to give his speech. They would make sure that he was okay. He had his crutches here. And then they would step back to make sure that he didn't fall down because they wanted to make sure that they honored him. Today, the media will not protect anybody's um, um, reputation. It doesn't matter if it's the president or not, whoever it is. Today, however, it seems that one of the top goals of the media is to disgrace and embarrass anyone and everyone at all costs, whoever they don't like. That's the kind of day and age that we're living in. All 19 things. But I want to give you hope. Somebody say hope. I want to give you hope of four moral responses for believers. The first one is this. Number one, we got to exalt God over ourselves. We got to exalt God over ourselves. I don't know if you can see that, but uh, we got to exalt God over ourselves. Exalting God and lifting him up is very, very important. I try to make it a daily practice and not because, oh, you're the pastor, you should. No, I should. I should anyway if I was a pastor or not. I try to make it a practice as soon as I wake up in the morning to roll off the bed and hit my knees. As soon as I hit my knees, I just say, God, thank you so much for this day. Help me to live the life that you called me to live. Help me to be a blessing wherever I go. Help me to stay humble. Help me to trust you in everything. Let me not be self-reliant. Let me not go in my own strength. Do not let me get tempted in trials or whatever I'm going to do. Help me make the right decisions. Hold in check my emotions. I just want to honor you today. Thank you, Lord, for my life, my wife, my kids, my blessing of the church, everything you give me. That's what I do. Just go to my knees. I don't have to spend 20 minutes there. I might fall asleep again. You know what I'm talking about? I'm just going, get to your knees before you get to that coffee. You know what I'm talking about? Get to the knees before you get to the coffee. Don't get the coffee before your knees. Then God is your coffee rather than God is your God. You know what I'm saying? So anyway, and, I, and I honestly, I don't feel saved until I had my first cup. Exalt Christ, and my wife would agree. Exalt Christ over self. That's why I go to God in prayer first. Oh, Lord, make me, make me a servant. Jesus, I want this to be humble. Anyway, moving right along. Think about this. Exalt God. Exalt God. I was reading in the book of Revelation, and you should read it. It's incredible. I saw these words. And a great multitude which no one could number in heaven. A multitude of people nobody could number. Then I read about a sea of glass mingled with fire in the glass on which people were again worshiping God in chapter 15. And you know what? It went through my mind and says, Mike, this is not about you. None of this is about you. It's all about God. So get over yourself. Yes, there'll be interesting things to see in heaven. Yes, I did a series on heaven. Yeah, yes, but if I'm honest, glass of fire and sea sounds pretty interesting. And I know we're not going to be singing for 10,000 years. I could sing of your love forever. How many of you remember that song? I got done with singing that song after you sang it three times because that song just dragged on and on and on. I sure hope heaven is not like that. But I can tell you, heaven is going to be amazing. Heaven is going to be powerful. It is your reward in the name of Jesus. The reward for trusting God. Come on, somebody say, thank you, Jesus. I have a friend who just went to be with the Lord. A lot of you might know him. His name is Livingston Hickling. And Livingston Hickling served in the United States National Guard. And he died at the young age of 43. But what I love about his ceremony, which I could not attend, of course was that I actually got to see it on video. And he received the highest honors and is buried in hallowed ground at Arlington National Cemetery. And the honors and the rewards that he received are just incredible for a human being to get. But I can tell you this, when he breathed his last breath and he entered into the presence of God, that the rewards that he will receive will be so amazing. It, they will, his earthly rewards will, com will pale in comparison to what God is going to give him for his faithful service to him. I can tell you that, that there is a reward for us up in heaven in the name of Jesus. Somebody say amen. amen. Number one, we exalt Christ over ourselves. Number two, we submit and honor God's delegated authorities. We submit and honor God's delegated authority. And that's authority that's here on earth. And the worship team can come up. Jessica, why don't you come on up? And that's the earthly authority that has been placed over us. And that means that on November 4, when we find out who the next commander-in-chief of the United States of America is going to be, we will honor the office of whoever it is, whoever assumes that office by the casting of the ballots of the American people. 
and we honor the office. Whoever is going to be in the office of the mayor, we're going to honor that office. And whoever is going to be in the governor's race in two years from now, we're, well, yeah, we are going to, I oh, just was just joking. We're going to honor, sorry, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding, Mililani, I'm just kidding. Relax, everybody, relax. Don't get so PC on me, I'm just joking. Anyway, we will. We will honor everybody. And do you know that when you honor a delegated authority over you, you are actually honoring God? At the end, you're honoring God. And so if we dishonor a delegated authority over us, we're actually dishonoring the Lord. So think about that for a moment. Number three, we accept the Bible as the absolute authority over our lives. We don't pick and choose. We don't decide, this is, I believe this, and it doesn't really fit what the Bible says about the lifestyle or choices or um, what I want. We accept the Bible as the moral authority over our own lives. You think about this for a moment, because the spirit of this age, the lawless ones, the lawless one, the Antichrist says that I don't have to accept the Bible as the authority. Um, I can believe myths about what they say that the Bible was put together with a bunch of men and, or, or whatever. I, I, the lawless one says, I don't have to submit and honor authority. I can do anything I want. I can have anarchy. I can have chaos. I can self-rule. Nobody tells me what to do. Famous last words. Um, the lawless one says, I don't have to exalt and honor God. I exalt me and my truth my truth the lawless one says i don't have to aloha everybody i just love people who love me back because jesus said in the last days that the love of many will wax cold in matthew chapter 24 i believe that's where it was uh, uh, when you think of this, with this I, I don't have to accept the authority. Well, I can tell you this because 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 to 3 says this, I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. That why, why do we honor authority and pray for those who are in authority? Why do we pray for the mayor or the governor? Why do we pray for the president or the president-to-be? Why do we pray for these people? Because this is why. It's because when we do that and we are honoring people, we are praying for them, what do we get? We get peaceful lives lived and marked by godliness and dignity in the way that we carry ourselves. A lot of undignified situations going on throughout our country right now. People being pretty undignified. When you think about all of this, the polarization that you feel you are being pulled in one direction and pulled in another direction, this is a tactic, and I believe, that the enemy, the devil, is trying to throw on us. See, the spirit of this age is the Antichrist. And the Antichrist is one of, listen to this, of deception, of anarchy, of chaos, of immorality, Definitely on the sexual immorality side. Um, if we make the mistake of giving in to this, then we are in trouble. And I'm going to tell you that today we live in a time unparalleled. I worry about our United States of America. And you think about this for a moment. It was a, it is a great nation. It's, 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 it's the best. There have been greater kingdoms. The Greeks with Alexander the Great was a greater kingdom. The Medes and the Persians out of Iran, a greater kingdom. You think about the British Empire, a greater kingdom. You think about the Roman Empire, a greater kingdom. But there has never been a greatest nation under God because our nation was founded under biblical principles. And don't let, the, don't let the history books lie to you that it wasn't a bunch of Masons or Freemasons. It was men and women that believed in the Word of God as the absolute authority that wanted to create, so to speak, a new Jerusalem. Because if you look at the mark of a great nation, there is peace and prosperity across the board. 
at varying degrees with peace and prosperity. I can tell you in the Persian Empire, there was not peace and prosperity for everybody. I can tell you that in the Roman Empire, that Christians were being killed or slaves were being killed at any time. I can tell you that in, in Great Britain, that they had no problem with slavery back in the day. I can tell you this. I can tell you that it's the United States that finally woke up and realized that all of those things were wrong. I can tell you that this experiment called democracy, God shed his grace on thee is a great experiment and has been working for 240 years but if we do not uphold the biblical standard of living aloha everybody and love everybody and submit an, uh, an honor authority and exalt God then God's hand will not be graced on thee and he will remove his hand of blessing and protection that has been obviously on the United States of America obviously it is this country that helps everybody no matter what and his hand will be taken off and then we will see even greater things coming towards our people and towards our nation is this making sense so here what's holding the Antichrist back and what's preserving the earth right now is the restrainer give me the verse for the restrainer please guys I'm getting lost in my colors this is my all the colors in my notes and I'm lost already you know how you get too fancy for yourself and throw yourself off that's what's happening it's like a kid trying to dribble between his legs all the time and he keeps kicking the ball that's me right now you got it hello Hello. Okay, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. <laughs> I got you. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 5. Paul writes to the church in Thessalonica. He says, don't you remember what I told you all this? Don't you remember that I told you about all this? That's not grammatically correct. Anyway, don't you remember that I told you all about this when I was with you? And you know what is holding him back. Who's him? The Antichrist. For he can be revealed only when his time comes. Whose time? The Antichrist time. But who's in charge of time? God. Not Kronos, but Kairos. Kronos is on my watch. Kronos is on my iPad. Kairos, K-A-I-R-O-S, is God's timing. Remember, a day is like a thousand years to the Lord, a thousand years like a day. I'm almost done. Listen to this. And, and you know what is holding him back, for he can be revealed only when his time comes. For this lawlessness is already at work secretly. This lawlessness is already at work secretly. And it will remain secret until the one who is holding it back steps out of the way. Who is the one that's holding it back? The restrainer. Who is the restrainer? The restrainer is either one of two things or a combination of both. It is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the restrainer. He's preserving us right now. He's preserving Christians. He's preserving our faith. He's holding it back. The restrainer is also the church. The church is holding it back. The church is still here. When a church gets raptured up because we're not appointed to wrath, and while we are gone out of here, then the restrainer is gone, and it's a free-for-all after that. So it's either the Holy Spirit, it's the church, a combination of both. You can't have the church without the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus, right? And he says that this man will come to do the work of Satan with counterfeit power and signs and wonders. He will use every kind of evil deception to fool you or fool those on their way to destruction because they refuse to love and accept the truth that would save them. And then, so God will cause them to be greatly deceived and they will believe these lies and then they will be condemned for enjoying evil rather than believing the truth. So you see that the great deceiver, Satan, our adversary, the Antichrist, the restrainer will be removed. And then many will be fooled. Um, it's going to be done on the media. It's going to be done in social media. It's going to be done. You guys, I'm too hot. You, um, it's going to be done in different ways. And when, But when Christ comes back, let me tell you, the whole world will see him in the twinkling of, in the twinkling of an eye. By the archangel shout, the dead in Christ will rise. You're going to hear... This, oh my gosh, it's just going to be incredible. And we're going to be with him, everybody. So what is our job? Our job, in the meantime, is reach as many people as possible. Aloha, everybody. Share your love. Share the love. Don't share the judgment. Share the love. Share the love of Christ. Pray for people. Continue to be intercessors now more than ever before. You know, this is October. And in October, this is when, when, when it gets more crazy spiritually. 
because I can tell you right now, there are people with powerful weapons in the spiritual realm who are praying against the church and they are praying against pastors and they want to see the church go down because the church is the restrainer. And if you remove the church and you take out a church, you take out a pastor, you take out people, I can tell you right now, then they have an easier time of making a headway. I didn't want to scare you. I just want to prepare you in the name of Jesus. Somebody say amen. Amen. So now, you can't have both legs, one in the world and one in Christ. Jesus said, be in the world, but not of the world. So you can't quit your jobs. You still have to work in the world. But you don't have to be of the world, the spirit of this age. You have to be one or the other. Choose Christ. It's not the same, in my opinion, of what Paul said to the church in Laodicea. He says, I want you hot or I want you cold, but I don't want you lukewarm. So pick one. He's not saying, I want you cold, your faith cold. I don't want you for God. He's not saying that. Versus, I want you hot for God. If you want to go cold, go cold. No. He's saying, I don't want you lukewarm. I want you cold and invigorating like an ice plunge, like a helo ice pond. You know what I'm talking about? Or I want you hot. I want you like the springs at the YMCA. No, never anymore. Never again. I want you to be all hot. I want you to be, I, I want you invigorating. Choose this day who you will serve. This is not fooling around. This is 20% prophecy, 300, 300 for the first coming, 1845 for the second, at an 8 to 1 ratio. And God never fails. It never fails. So let's bow our heads and pray. Father, we just come before you today in the name of Jesus. We thank you for your grace, your mercy, and your truth. We thank you that Second Peter says this, that you are not willing that anyone would perish. Because a day is like a thousand years to the Lord and a thousand years is like a day. And that you love us and that you're calling us and you're waiting, but your patience is running thin. And so Lord, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would love us, you would convict us, and that many would come to know you as Lord and Savior for the first time. I pray people who are lukewarm. I pray the people who are comfortable. I pray the people who might become indifferent. I pray people who have been backsliding and straddling fences would wake up in the name of Jesus and surrender their lives to him. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody said.